when I was in primary school, I had an uncle, a family friend, who, after being unable to get a good paying job and struggling to take care of his family for a while, uh, he and other members of the family, the extended family, came together, raised the necessary money, and they got him a commercial bus, what we call Danfo. He became a Danfo driver in Lagos then. While on duty one of those days, the police stopped him and said they needed his bus to go raiding. This a policeman with gun. He had no option but to accede their requests. And that was how, from about 7-8 o'clock that evening, he started carrying them around. As they were going, they were picking different people and dropping them in the bus. Around 10-11 p.m., the bus was filled. So they asked him to drive them to the police station. Upon getting to the police station, they asked everyone to come down from the bus. So being the driver, he waited for all the people they had taken to be offloaded. And then he wanted to keep driving. He and his conductor. His conductor was his cousin. So he's a distant relative of mine. They wanted to like drive out of the police station when the policemen stopped them and said no, they should also come down. <laughs> he had to start explaining himself that, ah, sir, I was the driver of the bus. You guys just stopped me and asked me to give you a lift that I should, you commandeered my bus and said I should take you around. And as he was giving explanation, they said, no, just don't worry. All those ones are saying, don't worry about that. Just come down first. You are in a police station already. These are armed policemen. How do you fight against them? He had no option but to come down. So they picked him and his conductor and they locked them up along with all the other people they had taken from the raid. This was around the year 2001, 2002. At this time, the GSM was in use in Nigeria, but it is not as common as it would come to be 10 years later and even up to now. So, they couldn't call his family to report the situation. They just locked them up. They said, okay, everybody, the money with you, bring it out. So, among those passengers that, among those people they had picked on the road, some of them had a few thousand naira with them. They released them immediately. Those that did not have any money on them, they locked them up. Now, this my uncle and his conductor, who is also a relative of mine, they had been having issues with the bus. So all the money they had made, they had spent it trying to fix the bus that day. The money left on them was just little change. The police collected it from them and said, no, they can't release them, that this money was too small. So they locked them up. Meanwhile, his wife, my aunt, she was expecting him back around 10, 11. He did not come back. So she had to stay up waiting for him, thinking, okay, probably because the bus is 40, the bus probably stopped walking at a very far place, a place far from the house. So probably that is what is delaying them. So she stayed up late waiting for them to come. The longer it took, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, they were not back. So by morning, she uh, she was agitated. She had to start running up and down that, ah, my husband, something has gone wrong. He's not back home. Help. So she, at, it was at this point she came to report to my parents. My parents, other family members, the extended family came together 
and they started going up and down looking for him. They went to different police stations to report him missing along with his conductor. The parents for his conductor do not stay in Lagos, they stay in our village. Uh, his elder sister, meanwhile, was informed she stays in Lagos, not far from our place also. So she too, she got involved in trying to find her younger brother. So since different police stations had no idea what happened, they were they asked the family to go to the state's CID, I think Kwanti then, to go and report so that they can like coordinate the investigation from there. On getting to state CID, she reported the case and then they said, oh, this name you mentioned, it seems we have someone like that in our custody. So, this is about a week after the man was declared missing. They went to bring him out. The wife identified him. Oh, this is my husband. This is my cousin. Ah, they are the ones we are looking for. Release them for us. And then the police said, no, that these are criminals. At this point, the news the police was giving to us was different. They said the man was a member of the OPC. This is around the year 2002, as I mentioned earlier. 2001-2002. As at that time, OPC had been declared to be illegal. They were being arrested randomly. Obason, the Obasanjo led government was trying to shut them down because of some incidents that had gone wrong in Lagos. The police said this man is a member of the OPC. This is someone who does not speak the Yoruba language. As in, he cannot put together a meaningful sentence in Yoruba language. How do you think someone that cannot speak the language would be admitted into a pan sociocultural Yoruba group? The family had to come together and we are trying to get the police to release him. The police said no. They mentioned a very hefty amount at that point and said, this is the bail amount. The family could not raise the money. And within a couple of weeks, my uncle was charged to court for armed robbery, for being a member of the OPC, and some other charges. His boss was impounded as evidence. So it couldn't even be given to someone else to ride on his behalf and then maybe make some money. His wife had to stop going to her shop. Every day she was going to the cell to see her husband, taking food to him and his cousin. It took over six months. The family had to come together, raise money to get a lawyer to represent him in court. It took about six months then before eventually my uncle was released from police custody. By the time he was released, he was a shadow of himself. He was a different man. Totally different from the man who was taken into custody. He had lost weight. He was emaciated, struggled to speak, had scars all over his body, couldn't walk properly. My cousin, my relative, he was also badly injured, but because he was younger, he was able to heal a bit faster. The boss was not referred, he was not returned to the family. The police just took it away. It was even damaged beyond repair at that point. The windscreen was gone, the back screen was gone, the tires were all deflated. You couldn't start the engine again. 
a vehicle that hasn't yeah. been put on, they haven't warmed it, they haven't driven it for over six months at that time. The engine was gone, the body was gone. The family was just happy that their brother came out alive. At least that is something being worth being thankful for. But then, the person who is alive was not the same person they had known. I only saw him a couple of times after he was released and at this point I think I was in junior secondary school, maybe GS1. This man was totally different from the man I knew growing up. I've known him, I've known him all my life. He was totally different. In less than three years after that time, my uncle died. The easiest way to describe it is to say he never recovered. A part of him was already dead from that experience. His body was just waiting to join his soul. That is just the best way I can describe it. He never recovered. He left behind three children, two boys and a girl, and a widow. At the time he was released, our business was already gone. The family was making contributions, trying to help them stay afloat. After he passed on, hmm, it was a struggle. The children had to grow up fatherless. I am age mate with his second child. His first child should be a year or two older than me. The second child is just about my age mate or a year younger. The third child is probably five, six years younger than me. Imagine that children of that age lost their father to an unreasonable police force. So when this generation comes out and demands that a sect of the police that is now over a hundred times worse than that incident I just described to you, that have killed people for no reason. This is not a case of they arrest them, they beat them up, they injure them, then they release them after years, which is still happening. I'm talking about killing them right away. I still saw a video of a man in one of the South South States who lost his 20 year old son. How do you think that man feels right now? How do you think his wife feels? How do you think the boy's siblings feel? This is why we are asking that the government ends the special anti-robbery squad. The police needs whole form reform. They need restructuring. They need better training. They need better equipment. They need constant psychological and mental tests and therapy. We need bright minds to come into the police force. Changes need to be carried out from the top to the bottom of the police hierarchy. But the first sign that we will take that this government has started that process is when they put an end to SARS. 
Once they do that, then we'll know they are serious, that they have heard our voice, and that the reform would start. Until then, we would remain on the streets. The protest will get bigger. We know that if we stop this protest right now, for anything other than an end to SARS, these SARS officers would come out and act at least 10 times worse. Rather than take that risk, we want the government to put an end to them first. We are not asking that they should be fired. They are all police officers. If they are, if they are, if they are moved away from SARS departments, if the SARS unit is disbanded, they would still be reabsorbed into other arms of the police force. Their skills, their expertise, their weapons will not be thrown away. It will be taken to other units where it will still be useful. Every arm of the police is against armed robbery. So what do you need a special anti-robbery squad for? At the time they were set up, yes, they had a function, but they have derailed sharply. This is not what they were set up for. We want all the older people, the adults, fathers and mothers, to come out to support their children. It is your children that are being killed. Speak for us. Maybe then the government will take us serious. And SARS.